Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yevshan, your host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report Podcast, and today's Tuesday, July the 30th, 2024. It has been 3,836 days since Russia started covert military operations in Crimea, 10 years and 160 days since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, and 2 years and 157 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression. Today's podcast covers the events that happened on Monday and Tuesday morning. You may find the Russia-Ukraine war map helpful to visualize the areas discussed. There is a link in the podcast description and the ram up updates. The Russia-Ukraine war report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine morning reports, Operational Commands North, South and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, Aaron House team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission – the truth, because the truth matters. Here is my daily assessment. 1. In our assessment, there is an elevated probability of a large-scale missile and drone attack on Ukrainian civilians and civilian infrastructure in the next seven days. 2. In our assessment, Russian forces have breached Ukrainian defenses at Progress and will likely continue to advance west and southwest due to favorable terrain, which could eliminate the natural defensive boundary formed by the Vovcha River. 3. We maintain that Russia will continue to make tactical gains during its current offensive, but low troop morale, poor battlefield medicine, corruption and degraded logistics make it highly unlikely that Russian forces can achieve their 2024 operational goals. 4. We maintain that despite the latest breach, Russian losses of armor, mobility and personnel are unsustainable. 5. The Ministry of Defense of Ukraine remains unsuccessful in de-Sovietizing its field commanders and meeting its obligations to properly train all new troops, resulting in preventable battlefield errors. 6. The policy of escalation management implemented by the NATO alliance and the United States, and to a small extent Germany, is a failure. We assess that the risk of a serious international incident is increasing due to Moscow's belief that NATO is unlikely to respond. 7. Continued delays in the delivery of promised military hardware, munitions and funding continue to prevent the Ukrainian armed forces from reaching their full combat potential. 8. We maintain that without a solution to restore air parity that slows the use of Russian glide bombs, Ukrainian troops will continue to be forced to withdraw as Russia destroys every defensible position and location. 9. Russia will continue to commit increasingly worse violations of international humanitarian law until international watchdogs and Ukraine's allies take a unified and firm stance. 10. We maintain the world is caught in the mutually assured destruction instability paradox. 11. Russia's sustained attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, which has destroyed over 80% of its combined thermal and power plant capacity, is a continuation of Russian crimes against humanity that started in October 2022, as outlined in four arrest warrants issued by the International Criminal Court. 12. The attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure have incrementally increased the chance of an intentional nuclear accident at multiple nuclear facilities in Ukraine. Russia continues to target civilians and civilian infrastructure. Yesterday there were no reports of Shahed-136 one-way drone or missile strikes. Russian artillery strikes, drone strikes and bombings targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure killed at least four and wounded 14. Historically, periods of reduced activity are an indicator that Russia is in the final phase of preparing for a large-scale attack. Russia has recently repositioned strategic aviation assets closer to Ukraine and the usual firing points over the Caspian Sea and deployed three kilo-class submarines in the Black Sea.
Except now for today's action report summary. On Monday, Russia carried out 149 assaults, and through July the 29th, the seven-day moving average for daily attacks dropped slightly to 139. The VKS, that's the Russian Aerospace Forces, carried out 62 airstrikes, dropping 99 bombs on civilian and military targets. Russian ground units carried out almost 4,600 fire missions with tubed and barrel artillery. Russian forces are exploiting the new breach of Ukrainian defenses at Progress and have rapidly advanced in the last 24 hours. The next 48 to 72 hours will determine if a breakthrough has been achieved. So, let's talk about what happened on the battlefield. This would be a good time to open up our Russia-Ukraine war map. There are a lot of updates. Ready? Here we go. Starting in the Kharkiv Oblast, we begin in the Lipsy Vovchansk area of operation, or AO. Fighting continued in Vovchansk and Hliboka, with no change in the situation. In the Kupiansk AO, Russian forces continued their attempts to advance in the direction of Novosinova from occupied Pishchane. In the Svatov AO of the Luhansk Oblast, Russian attempts to advance in the direction of Stelmachivka were unsuccessful. To the south, near Kremina, Russian forces have reached the eastern edge of Makiivka. Russian attempts to advance in the direction of Nevske and Terny were unsuccessful. Russian forces attacked Ukrainian positions in the Serebrensky forest, suffered losses and retreated to their defensive positions. Now, let's talk about the Donbass and the northeastern part of the Donetsk Oblast. In the Siversk AO, Russian assaults on Verkhnyokamyansk from Zolotarivka, in Spirne, in the direction of Ivanodarivka, southeast of Vyimka, and in the area of Parayizne were unsuccessful. Russian forces remain on the east side of the Siversk Donetsk Donbass Canal in the Kostantinivka AO. Russian troops continued their attempts to advance in the direction of Grigorivka and near Bogdanivka without success. Fighting continued on the western edge of Kalinivka and the canal district of Chesivyar, and Russian attacks continued in Klishchivka. A Russian video confirmed that Ukrainian forces still occupy the pump house and dam in western Kurdumivka. Russian forces carried out 19 assaults in the Toretsk New York AO, where Ukrainian forces continued to hold their defensive lines. Almost two-thirds of Russian assaults were from Druzhba to Kostantinivka in the Vogledar AO. Fighting was reported in or in the areas of Druzhba, Toretsk, Pivnichne, Zalizne, Pivdenne and New York, with no significant changes. In southwestern Donetsk Oblast, Russian forces carried out 52 assaults in the Pokrovsk AO, where the situation remains critical due to the breach of Ukrainian defenses at Progress. Russian forces concentrated their combat power in the direction of Malinivka and Grodivka, with attacks continuing on the eastern edge of Ostvizhenka, with no change in the situation. Yesterday, our analysts geolocated many videos between Novo Alexandrivka and Novoselivka Persia. Russian troops remained on the eastern edge of Timofeevka and advanced west and southwest of Lozovatske. Russian troops continued to advance along the railroad grade and the T-511 highway, reaching Vasele, that's the one west of Progress, where intense fighting continued. Russian troops made additional gains in the direction of Sergeyevka and Jelanne and raised a flag in the southwestern part of Vovche, which I told you about yesterday. Geolocated videos showed Russian troops were on the north bank, that's the west side, of the Vovche River between Vovche and Yevhenivka. Russian troops also raised a flag in the western part of Novoselivka Persia. Based on terrain analysis, we assess that Ukrainian forces have withdrawn from the south bank, that's the east side, of the Vovche River. We coded Yevhenivka and Novoselivka Persia as under Russian control adjusted the line of conflict and adjusted the gray area. From Vovcha to Karlivka, the Vovcha River and connected reservoirs provide a significant natural defense, and Russian capabilities to make wet crossings are severely degraded. 
moving to assessment. When Russian forces captured Ucharetene and started attacking in almost all directions, we outlined several possible scenarios for Moscow's operational goals. We considered Russian forces bypassing the Vovchi River from the north in the direction of Progress or Malinivka as the biggest threat to Ukraine, due to the terrain becoming very unfavorable almost to Marnograd. We also considered a Russian attempt to collapse Ukrainian defensive positions in Toretsk and New York was a possibility. That would complicate Ukrainian logistics on the H-20 highway, which serves as a ground line of communication, that's a supply line, to Kostantinivka and Chasivyar. In that analysis, we believed that if Russia could take control of the H-20 and T-504 highways, the continued defense of Toretsk, Kostantinivka and Chasivyar would become complicated. This would set conditions for the capture of New York, Toretsk, Mirnograd and Pokrovsk. Further north, if Russian forces captured Siversk or made its continued support impossible, conditions would be set to attack Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. The Russian operational and strategic goals are now clear, and that is their strategy. Capture Pokrovsk, Toretsk, New York and Chasivyar and collapse Ukrainian defense lines around Siversk. Russian forces have not been able to make significant gains in the direction of Siversk, but the situation is slowly deteriorating. At Chasivyar, Russian forces have not been able to cross the Siversk Donetsk Donbass Canal. We assess that Russian commanders are treating the capture of the settlement as a subordinate attack meant to hold Ukrainian resources in place. At Toretsk and New York, Russian forces took advantage of the troop rotation involving the Ukrainian 41st Motor Infantry Brigade, which was also involved in the loss of the canal district in Chasivyar. After initial rapid advances, the situation is difficult but somewhat stabilized. In the short term, Russian commanders also appear to be treating this as a subordinate attack. Russian forces crossing north of the headwaters of the Vovchia River was the worst-case scenario for Ukrainian defenders. In an interview with Radio Svoboda, Ukrainian 47th Motor Infantry Brigade Chief Sergeant Oleg Chaus said that the 31st Motor Infantry Brigade partially caused the loss of progress. He claimed that the 1st and 3rd battalions broke out of the encirclement without coordinating with area units, creating a gap in the defensive lines. Speaking about the Russian advance, quote, They pressed non-stop. They provided a large number of personnel that had not been used until that moment. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, did not provide a statement to Radio Svoboda, but this aligns with what our contacts told us after the 31st broke out. Russian forces will suffer significant casualties while advancing through the beet and wheat fields between Vesela and Hrodivka, Sergeyevka and Jelanna, but the Kremlin doesn't care. The terrain is now unfavorable for Ukrainian defenders, and if Russian troops can pivot to the south, the benefits of the Vovchia River will be eliminated. Three of the four command mistakes of 2024 combined to potentially allow Russian forces to advance within barrel artillery range of Pokrovsk and the critically 20 and 504 highways. In our final assessment, this was preventable and Ukrainian forces are facing their biggest challenge since their withdrawal from Avdiivka. The truth matters, and I wish I had better news. Back to the action report. Further south, fighting for control of Yasnobrodivka continued, and Russian forces remained stuck between Natailova and Karlivka. Russian forces carried out 21 attacks in the Vuhledareyo. Russian and Ukrainian sources reported continued fighting in Krasnohorivka. Russian attempts to advance from Pobeda were unsuccessful, as were attempts to advance into the western part of Paraskovivka. South of Kostantinivka, Storm Z and regular Russian forces made additional gains in the direction of the T-532 highway. Finally, in the Vremivka AO, GSFU reported that attacks near Velika Novosilka were repulsed.
In the Zaporizhia Oblast, the spokesman for the Tavria Operational Strategic Group of Troops, Dmitry Lehovy, said that Russian forces had become more active, launching two assaults from occupied Rashatilivske in the direction of Huleypola. Speaking on Marathon, Lehovy said, quote, According to our intelligence, it is a continuation of the tactics of small assault actions because the total numbers of the Russian group in Zaporizhia Oblast have not changed in terms of the number of troops. In the Urihivayo, there were only reports of positional fighting southeast of Malatok Machka, in the area of Verbove and near Robotina. In the Khersonayo, positional fighting continued on the islands in the Dnipro River. Here is my theater-wide update. During an official visit to Kyiv, the United States Special Representative for the Reconstruction of Ukraine, Penny Pritzker, announced she was resigning on September 30. She told journalists that her congressional mandate ends with the fiscal year and she will not seek a second term. Pritzker said the mission was not ending, telling reporters, quote, I'm not the only one committed to this job. The Biden administration is committed to Ukraine's economic recovery, so there will be permanence in our work. The U.S. Department of Defense announced a $200 million military aid package to Ukraine using presidential authority drawdown funds. The details of what's included in the package are in our daily situation report, and there's a link in the podcast description. Highlights include air defense missiles, rockets for HIMARS, artillery and motor ammunition, anti-tank weapons, and unspecified electronic warfare equipment. The Department of Defense also announced a $1.5 billion long-term military assistance package through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. The funds will be used to improve Ukraine's air defense, fire control, and anti-tank weapon resources and sustain equipment that is already in the field. Germany also announced a new military aid package for Ukraine in partnership with Denmark. Highlights of their package include Leopard 1A5 main battle tanks, armored recovery vehicles, anti-aircraft ammunition, and a portable field hospital. And that's what we know. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.